it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Rise of the Mighty Diplodocus by Taxi Dancer Ed was the newest craze in the heavy metal genre, introduced by a trio of heavy metal musicians calling themselves Diplodocus. The artwork on the band's first album cover featured a heavily armoured skeleton knight, spikes adorning his black armour, lightning shooting from empty eye sockets, Riding atop a ferocious Diplodocus, with his bloody jaws filled with meat ripping fangs snapping shut on the neck of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. In the background, a silhouetted castle wreathed in lightning stood on the edge of a cliff to complete the motif of what seemed to be required of every single heavy metal album cover ever. Even though the docile, long-necked dinosaur was a gentle herbivore, well, science be damned. The name Diplodocus sounded cool and prehistoric. The album art was even cooler, and none of Diplodocus's fans seemed to care, so the band stuck with the name, and thus the male subgenre known as cave metal was born. Diplodocus's lead singer was a gruff, tattooed spirit named Leonard Weisenstein III, who dropped out of accounting school in college and changed his name to Gore Bam Smasher after Diplodocus got his first record deal with Nuclear Kill Blast Death Explosion Records, the same recording company that signed some of the more horrifically popular death metal bands like Genital Fangs, Cthulhu's Nagging Wife, and the somewhat more upbeat Christmas black metal band Raging Chlamydia, whose rendition of Silent Night was said to have influenced a violent spate of leather-spiked vandals to leave plastic nativity scenes on random front lawns this past August. Leonard, or rather, Gore Bamsmasher, was not only the lead singer of the band, but also played guitar. His bandmates, Chaim Eisen, aka Swifty Kickballs, played lead guitar, whilst the last member of Diplodocus, Bert Witz, aka Bert, was the band's bass player. Gore Bamsmasher and Swifty Kickballs were practically twins, both being skinny, pale, lanky and tall, with close-set eyes and thin, pointed noses and chins, though Gore's long brown hair was wavy while Swifty's was dirty blonde and stringy. They were looking for a bass player when they met Bert, who was playing in a band called Minimalist. When they asked Bert to join Diplodocus, Bert simply said, Yes. Bert was the shortest of the three, skinny and with darker skin and a shaggy mop of curly black hair which dropped down in front of his face to hide his eyes. Bert usually wore a pair of round lens sunglasses and sported a black leather top hat, a unique fashion statement displayed by band members in practically every band during the heydays of the 1980s hair metal. At one point, they even had a drummer. Now, technically, Diplodocus wasn't the musically savviest of bands, not like Nickelback, Limp Bizkit, or Creed. But Diplodocus found that with guttural screeching, barely incomprehensible vocals, and the knowledge of a few chords played in rapid succession on speakers turned out to eleven, they quickly became metal gods on the local LA club circuit. Diplodocus introduced the cave metal genre to an industry which was already rife with sub-genres such as hair metal, arena metal, grunge metal, black metal, symphonic metal, industrial metal, rap metal, J-pop metal, death metal, and so on. Their new genre focused on simplistic lyrics, guttural vocals, heavy drum beats, and, on stage, primal jumping and chest beating. Every night, in every venue they performed, with the heavy bass drums beating rhythmically behind him, and guitars tortured screeching, Gore Bam Smasher would jump around on stage, pumping his fist in the air and beating his chest as he grunted out the lyrics of the song that propelled Diplodocus to cave metal stardom. I make you be, no, be good in as deep and demonic a voice as he could muster. Gore Bam Smasher would bellow, I make you be no be good. Instead, I make you be bad. You want to eat your vegetables. I give you red meat instead. You give me flowers and pie. I give you fire and die. You want to say have a nice day. 
I say you blow them away. I make you angry and mean. I make you drink the gym bean. You want just planting some beans and fix your fence when it leans. I make you be no be good. Instead I make you be bad. You won't say prayers at night. Instead I make you pick fight. I make you be no be good. I make you be no be good. I make you be no be good. And this will be followed by a heavy drum solo, then a guitar solo, lots of grunting and screaming, and maybe, if the fans were lucky, a little vomit. Diplodocus was riding high on a wave that was just getting bigger and bigger, well, as far as the subgenre of cave metal was concerned. Their first album, which they'd released under Nuclear Kill Blast Death Explosion Records, named Death by Diplodocus, had just debuted at number 272 on Billboard's Top 100, and also came in at number 49 in Northern Europe's Top 50 New Metal Albums of the Day, but came in at number 2 on the chart of Best New Artists at the Community College of Portland, Oregon. With the success, relatively speaking, of their first album, Nuclear Kill Blast Death Explosion Records naturally planned an extensive tour of the band for Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, and the Midwest, before shuttling the band off to play venues in Canada. Swifty Kickballs, the band's lead guitarist, was especially excited to travel to Canada, as he'd admitted that he always wanted to visit Europe. Still, the band was faced with a big problem. As they sat around the basement in Bert's mum's house, six half-eaten club sandwiches, two barely-touched large pepperoni pizzas and a dozen empty Snickers, meat sticks and bags of corn chip wrappers between them, the band stared dejectedly at each other through a haze of marijuana smoke. It was less than two weeks until the start of their world tour to support the release of their first album, and they were short a drummer. The backbone of the band's hard-beating rhythm core was Joseph Sleepy Joe Scranton, who only three days ago had ignored what he was cooking on his stove due to suffering a terrible headache from extreme ice cream sandwich consumption. Falling asleep on his couch while waiting for his ice cream headache to pass, Sleepy Joe's meth lab trailer home went up in a spectacular explosion which the LA Times later reported as an explosive fatality caused by the coronavirus. This tragedy was immediately followed by an announcement by the head of the CDC encouraging Americans to get the 27th and latest version of the COVID booster shot, which protected against meth lab explosions. Still, despite the flood of condolences and well wishes from both cave metal fans and meth addicts, without a drummer, Diplodocus wouldn't be able to tour. Hey, uh, what about Yancey Stangbitch? said Swifty, sitting out from his chair. I heard a rumor that he suddenly stopped playing with his band last week. Really? said Gore. Yancey quit playing for shredded gut stew. Yeah, I'll give him a call. Hey, Bert, didn't you and him play together back in the day with your first band, God of Flatulence? Bert's shaggy black hair shook as Bert nodded. Yes. You still got his number? Reaching into his cargo shorts pocket and pulling out his phone, Bert's hair shook again as he nodded. Yes. Pulling up Yancey's number, Bert leaned across the recliner he was lounging in and tossed the phone to Gore. Here. Gore put the phone up to his ear and didn't have to wait long before a female-sounding voice picked up. Hey, Yancey, it's Gore from Diplodocus. You got a minute? Uh, oh, this is his mama. Oh, hi, Mrs. Stangbitch. Is Yancey home? Really? Uh, his name isn't Yancey Stangbitch. His real name is Arnold Reinhold. Uh, why is your last name Stangbitch? It's not. Oh, well, is Yancey, I mean, is Arnold available? Really? No way. Get out. Oh, that was so metal. Um, can we see the body? An agonized female wail could be heard echoing from the other end of the phone before the call abruptly ended. Hello. Hello. Mrs. Stangbitch? Gore stared at the phone and shrugged as he tossed it back to Bert. Thanks, Bert grunted. What was that all about? asked Swifty, eyes wide as he stared at Gore from the video game chair he was sitting in. Did Yancey go back to shredded gut stew? Well, uh, 
sort of, answered Gore, eyes wide and smirking dumbly. That was Yancey's mom. She said Yancey was working part-time at the munitions factory testing safety pins for army hand grenades. Apparently one in a million safety pins are defective. Yancey found it last week. Oh, no way, exclaimed Swifty. That's awesome, dude. Hey, call his mom back and ask if we can go to the funeral. We can play Shredded by Shrapnel as a tribute. Gore nodded in agreement, but Bert instead grunted. Drummer? Oh, Bert's right, said Gore. We can't be concentrating on a funeral when we need to get ready to tour, and we're still short of drummer. They stared at the television with drooping, bloodshot eyes, each trying to brainstorm who could fill the band's empty drummer seat. During the commercial that interrupted the anime they were watching, the head of the CDC appeared on screen, encouraging Americans to get the 28th and latest COVID vaccine, which the head of the CDC promised would protect against grenade safety pin malfunctions. Add, grunted Bert, pointing at the television. What? Add, repeated Bert. Well, that's not a bad idea, Bert, said Gore. We can place an ad on Craigslist or something. Maybe even the back of milk cartons where people look for missing people. We can say we're missing a drummer, said Swifty. Miss Wits. Gore leant back in his seat and yelled up the basement steps. What? came the voice of Bert's mom from upstairs in the kitchen. Can we borrow the money to place an ad for a new drummer tomorrow? No, came the reply from the kitchen. Okay then, um... And he could make us some hot chocolate? Yep, came the reply. And between the three of them, the band scratched together enough cash to run ads on several local art, music, and club sites. Wanted. Drummer for up-and-coming metal band preparing to go on a monumental worldwide tour of the world and the Midwest. Experience. Must have experience hitting things rapidly with sticks. Qualifications. Must not have been blown up or otherwise died in the past year. If interested, call Gore or Swifty or Bert's mom for details. The ad had only been up for an hour the next day, and the band was still in Bert's mom's basement when, on the wall where the television was mounted, a circular glowing ring of fire suddenly appeared, slowly widening and expanding, and revealing a black portal which seemed to lead into a realm of unquenchable fire. Emanating from this portal came the muffled screams of millions of people writhing in pain and the fetid scent of sulfur and rot. Swifty passed the blunt over to Bert, eyes wide and mouth agape as the ever-increasing circle of flame engulfed the television and blocked out the game of Grand Theft Auto they were playing. Dude, what those Jamaicans put in this? said Swifty. Hell, grunted Bert sleepily as he took another hit. The three of them never got up from their seats and simply stared ahead, passing the blunt around as the circular portal to hell in front of them grew wider. A figure walked towards the opening from the other side and casually stepped through into Bert's mum's basement. The entity was tall and skinny with deep, glossy red skin and burning yellow feline-like eyes. He wore an immaculately tailored midnight black Stuart Hughes Diamond Edition business suit which, somehow, allowed for the entity's red, spade-tipped tail to protrude seamlessly from the back, while the entity's hoofed feet fit nicely into a pair of polished dress shoes from Jason of Beverly Hills. Diamond rings adorned six-fingered hands, tipped with perfectly manicured, dagger-shaped fingernails. Despite the massive horns protruding from his forehead, the being's face was strikingly handsome. He sported a pencil-thin moustache and goatee, his lips parting in a friendly smile which revealed pearl white, razor-sharp teeth and fangs. A snow-white kitten with red-tipped ears followed the entity through the fiery portal. Do I have the pleasure of meeting the band Diplodocus? said the being in a voice that was deep and smooth and dripping with poisoned honey. Oh, how'd you get in here? muttered Gore nervously. Um, I called Bert's mom, answered the entity. Bert leaned back in his recliner and yelled, Mom? What? came the voice of Bert's mom from upstairs in the kitchen. Demon? yelled Bert. Yep, replied his mom. 
Okay, Bert replied. The being reached into his jacket and produced business cards, handing one to each band member. The card, which was covered in gold leaf, read, Billy Z. Bob, talent agent. Please allow me to introduce myself. Billy Z. Bob, executive talent agent, the entity said, bowing slightly, the smile never leaving his face. Very pleased to make your acquaintance. Well, you can turn off the bean burrito fart smell then, said Swifty, pinching his nose while waving his hands like a fan. Stinky, grunted Bert. I had to say, uh, rather pungent odor which you've bequeathed to us, Mr. Bob, added Gore, spraying the air freshener into the air which they usually use to mask the scent of the band's favorite habit from Bert's mum. Uh, yes, yeah, sir, well, muttered the being calling himself Billy's Bob. This is the maid's week off, so the trash didn't get thrown out on time. You'll get used to this man. Anyway, said Billy, quickly changing the subject. Congratulations on your newfound opportunities. I understand that you're preparing to go on tour and your band is in need of a competent drummer. Can you play the drums? asked Gore. Loud, added Bert. I represent the world's finest living artists, actors and musicians, continued Billy, ignoring the questions. I can literally provide the greatest talent on the planet to you for very little cost. Can you play the drums? asked Swifty. Loud, added Bert. I brought Ringo Starr to the Beatles. I brought Lars Ulrich to Metallica. I brought Tommy Lee to Modley Crew. I brought that cat guy to Kiss. Billy then brought his hand to his chin, contemplating briefly. Well, they can't all be winners. Anyway, I'd like to introduce my client to you. Gentlemen, announced Billy, it is my distinct pleasure to present to you Hellfire. The demon took a dramatic step to the side, flourishing his hands like a television game show model presenting a brand new car as a prize, and pointed down at the little white kitten with the red ears which had followed him through the portal. The kitten which the demon called Hellfire, was sitting next to him, nonchalantly licking himself on the crotch. So, can you play the drums? said Gore and Swifty in unison. Loud, said Bert. Can I play the... Oh, fools. Do you not know who I am? I'm Beelzebub. I'm the blasphemous evil. I am the evil ray. Oh, blah, blah, blah mewled Hellfire, yawning. The demon glared down at the kitten. Quiet, you. So you were with the band Blasphemous Evil and Evil Rain? said Swifty suspiciously. Cool, grunted Bert. I know some of the guys in those bands. I don't remember you. Gore folded his arms, wrinkling his nose at the demon. No, I'm the literal. Yes, yeah, so... You were in a few death metal bands, said Gore, interrupting the demon. Yeah, big deal. I played guitar for Burning Flame Helpit before they found Jesus and became a Christian band. Oh, said the demon. Don't say that name. <laughs> yeah, I know right, said Gore. When they changed their name to Church of Thessalonica, I knew I had to quit. What kind of ridiculous name is that for a band? I wasn't going to be a part of a band whose name I couldn't pronounce. Yeah, but you just pronounced it, pointed the demon. Uh, still, interrupted Gore. That's beside the point. Can you play the drums? Can I play the... mumbled the demon. Well, no. But I can play a mean golden fiddle. Want to hear? Dude, this isn't Georgia, said Gore. If you can't play the drums, you're just wasting our time. You can leave by that fire ring thing that you came in on. Take that smell with you. Bring back the GTA game. Oh, I was just about to force a prostitute to put on a mask before knocking her to the street for not obeying CDC social distancing guidelines. Enough, barked the demon. I'm not here to audition for your insipid little band. Swifty leaned over to Bert and whispered, Hey, uh, what does insipid mean? Sexist, grunted Bert, shrugging. 
What does he have against us being sexy? Replied Swifty. Look, as it says on my card, I'm a talent agent, said the demon, loudly grunting and clearing his throat to interrupt Swifty and Bert's conversation. I'm here representing my client who wishes to play drums in your band. Damn, dude, said Gore. You should have said that earlier instead of coming in here like a WWE wrestler intro and stinking up the whole basement. So, um, you can't play drums, but you brought us a drummer, said Swifty, the dimly lit light bulb finally coming on in his hand. Uh, yeah. And uh, who did you bring again? The demon pointed down to his side with his thumb. The kitten, remember? Kitty, grunted Bert. That's right, you lame-ass bitches. The kitten. Came a gravelly voice with the heavy accent of the old-school 1920s New York City boxer. The little white kitten with the red ears leapt up and bounded to the drum set, which was set up at the far corner of the basement. Grabbing up a pair of drumsticks, the kitten jumped on the stool and spun around. The name's Hellfire, losers. Pleased to meet ya. All of a sudden, one of Diplodocus' songs just began to loudly play from out of nowhere. It was a hard-pounding, rapid-fire instrumental ballad called Skull Smash Brain Love. It was a new song and incomplete, lacking the drum track since the band's last drummer got blown to pieces by Covid. Well, still, the kitten's drum backing blended perfectly with the driving rhythm of the song and created a beat that was melodic, haunting, fast, and of course, evil. How's he doing that? His feet can't even touch the drum pedals, gasped Swifty. He held up the blunt and stared at it nervously. Well, I don't know what they put in you, but I gotta get more. The band watched dumbfounded as the little kitten wildly gyrated its forepaws, eyes wide, mouth open and tongue flying about, throwing drumsticks in the air before catching them again in its paws and flawlessly continuing to beat the drums in an impossibly rapid pace as the song reached its climactic crescendo. The band hardly had a chance to catch their breaths after the song concluded when another song immediately began to play, again seeming to emanate from the air itself. It was the song which had put Diplodocus on the heavy metal musical map. I make you be no be good. The song opened with steady, ominous, pounding drum beats, which steadily increased in tempo as the bass and the guitars joined in to create a rhythm akin to a marching anthem for any army of club-wielding Neanderthal cavemen marching to war against an army fire-breathing pterodactyls. However, for this particular track, the drum beats weren't part of the song. Rather, the song became the drum beats, the two combining to create a hypnotic wave of both euphoria and violence, which seemed to permeate every corner of the basement and steadily increased while the lyrics, I make you be no be good, repeated over and over again. In minutes, the song reached its head banging conclusion, like the heavy, gut punching roar of a Russian artillery barrage. The song ended abruptly, and the drumming ceased as the band members slowly regained their senses. Gore had his hands around Swifty's neck, choking him while Swifty was on his knees in front of Gore, punching him in his crotch. The demon stood with a bored expression on his face, his arm outstretched next to him, hand held up. Bert's face was pressed into the demon's palm, fists swinging, his legs pumping in a fruitless effort to run forwards. As soon as the song ended, the three confused band members immediately stopped their violent actions and attempted to collect themselves, Bert stepping back and pulling his face away from the demon's open palm with a grunt of, sorry, as he adjusted his top hat back on his head. Gore turned to face the demon while Swifty got up from his knees and tried to adjust his disheveled t-shirt. The demon was smiling broadly, rubbing his hands together in front of his chest. Well, gentlemen he said, yellow eyes now burning bright. What do you think? Well, um, said Gore, clearing his throat. Um, we do have, uh, more people who want to audition. Swifty nodded his head. Yeah, hundreds. Lots, grunted Bert. Ah, bullshit, laughed the kitten from behind them, twirling a drumstick in his paws. 
He was still sitting on the drum set, which had somehow caught fire now. Who the hell are you jokers trying to fool? You losers ain't got jack squat that's better than me. Hellfire then jumped down from the drum set and walked around to look up at the band. Look, fellas, I ain't planning on joining your lame-ass band permanently. I'm just going to be with you during the tour. After which, when you three brig-headed knuckle-draggers become famous, I'll leave you and you can find yourselves another drummer. Deal? Well, gentlemen, said the demon, do we uh, have a deal? The three looked at each other, each smiling and nodding dumbly in their shared consensus. Ah, excellent, excellent. All I want in return, gentlemen, is 100% control of the societal influence that your music will create. Nothing more, nothing else, just that. You can have everything else. You can have all the money, all the fame, all the royalties, all the... Uh... Chicks, said Gore. Drugs, said Swifty. Two-thirds controlling stock options of every single beef, jerky, and meat stick manufacturer on the planet, plus a logistical supply line capable of going from factory to warehouse to consumer, unencumbered by supply chain delays due to the current pandemic, said Bert. Well, everyone, including the demon, turned and stared at Bert for several seconds. Sorry, grunted Bert as he lowered his head. Oh, cars? That's it? You don't want our souls or anything? said Swifty, turning to the demon. Well, the demon's face was expressionless, and he blinked a few times at the band before quickly quipping. I think that outcome is already a foregone conclusion. Now, anyway, gentlemen, if we are in agreement, let's just sign this contract, and I'll leave you all to your devices. So, um, how do you want us to do it? Prick our fingers and sign a leather contract in blood made from the flesh of a virgin? said Gore. What? said the demon. Uh, ugh, no, that's gross. Here, said the demon, producing an Acer laptop out of thin air, a brand surely designed in Hades. Just digitally sign this contract. Jeez, what kind of garbage is Hollywood spewing to brainwash you people these days? Demons don't steal souls by making people sign contracts on flesh paper in human blood. Demons do it by running global pharmaceutical companies. Oh, by the way, don't forget to get your 29th and latest COVID booster shot. It protects you from unclean interdimensional spirits coming into your basement through fiery portals. So, um, Mr. Billy, sir, said Swifty, will that also protect us from COVID? The demon stopped typing into the laptop and looked up at Swifty studying the doe-eyed expression on the young man's face for a few seconds before laughing. <laughs> you must be the funny one, eh? The demon picked up the laptop, looking at the contract and frowning as the Acer laptop didn't save the band's digital signatures. They had to repeat the process twice before the contract would save to his file of doomed souls, next to the file folders marked politicians and televangelists. Well, gentlemen smiled the demon once the files had saved. Our business here is done. I'll be taking my leave now. The demon turned to step through the portal, but stopped abruptly and turned. Oh, one more thing. I've provided you with new instruments, which will improve your, um, shall we say, lack of musical abilities. And in return, I'll take 90% of your royalties. The demon ducked into the portal again and... In an instant, he and the portal were gone, replaced by the television and the GTA game where the gangster thug character, which Gore was playing, was laying in the street and getting kicked in the balls by an angry prostitute ripping off a surgical mask from her face. Yeah, but, um, we still get the chicks right, yelled Gore at the portal that was no longer there. Bruh, muttered Swifty. Did that really just happen? Suddenly, the portal opened again, just large enough to allow the demon to poke his head through. Oh, I'm truly sorry, gentlemen. Old age is catching up to me. Hellfire requires about 300 pounds of Kobe beef a day, or the throats of three virgins. Oh, don't worry, I'll cover those. But I'll be taking 90% of the money you earn in return. <laughs> Cheers! The demon ducked back as the portal once again shut. Yeah, but 
we get the chick still, right? Repeated Gore. Dude, if he comes through that portal again saying he's taking the chicks, I'm out. Re fucking lax, Horndog, said Hellfire, walking around to address the band, a cigar clamped in the kitten's mouth. He ain't coming to get any of your chicks. Oh, Billy is genderless, just like vampires and... Oh, wait, that joke's already been used by them freaking Navy SEALs. So, um, what do we do now? said Swifty. What do you do now, Blondie? said Hellfire, pointing his cigar at the lead guitarist. You losers do exactly what you've always been doing. Nothing. You losers just sit back and let your little Hellfire take care of everything. I need you guys just to put your faces out there on stage. I'll be doing the messaging through you, capiche? Messaging, said Gore. I didn't know we had any messaging. We're just here to rock the world, party and screw chicks. Oh, and to piss off Jesus freaks, said Swifty. You know, we just wanted to live life and live life abundantly. Hellfire looked up at Swifty's face, cigar dangling from his open mouth, blinking for several moments. You, you, <laughs> you just fucking blew up my mind with your obtuse lack of cognizance. Yeah, roared Swifty. I blew the demon's pet kitten with words. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, said Hellfire, face pouring himself. God help me with these. Tor? grunted Bert. Yeah, 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 answered Hellfire. I got it all covered. Transportation, hotels, food. Hellfire then pointed at poor Gore. And girls. Gore smiled a toothy grin as Swifty raised an eyebrow at Hellfire. Yeah, 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 that too, Blondie, said Hellfire. Enough to collapse your veins, make your nose bleed, and your heart explode. Yeah! exclaimed Swifty. Slim, said Bert. Everyone stared at Bert for several seconds before finally he added, Jims? Brother, said Hellfire. I'll have fucking Bigfoot bring boxes of them to you himself. Diplodocus started their epic world tour in front of a sold-out crowd at the world-famous Whiskey A Go Go on LA's Sunset Strip, opening their set with their powerful, head-crunching song, Chainsaw Lobotomy, followed by Tyrannosaurus Thug, then their new instrumental ballad, Skull Smash Brain Love. Well, the instruments provided by the demon perfected any of the band's shortcomings in musical and even vocal talents, and the crowd loved it, jumping around the stage, grunting and beating their chests in their signature cheetah patterned loincloths, which Bert's mom had made for the band. Diplodocus belted out the song, Again, we're going to headbang again, before coming to the last song of the set. I make you be no be good. I make you be no be good. Instead, I make you be bad. You won't say prayers at night. Instead, I make you pick fight. I make you be no be good. 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 But this last song was different from the others that came before. The beating of the drums, the music, the lyrics. Somehow they all combined to create a sound wave of euphoria and violence which permeated the entire club removing any inhibitions from the head-banging crowd to not act upon the rage and aggression which had been implanted within them. By the time Diplodocus ended the song, the entire whiskey a gogo was empty, the crowd having burst out of the club to violently riot, vandalize, and smash in store windows around LA to loot the establishments. This, however, went largely unnoticed by the general public. After all, this was LA, and it was a Friday night. Critical reviews in the local publications and on LA Music websites were overwhelmingly positive of Diplodocus's show, most praising the band for their diversity in allowing a small, domesticated pet to play in the band, although animal rights groups were concerned that the kitten might not have been paid at the same scale as its other white male band members, while another fringe community demanded to know the sexual orientation of the kitten, 
so as to jump at the opportunity to be offended that the kitten was not receiving fair and equitable treatment due to its gender identity. Gore, Swifty and Bert were hardly capable of doing anything vertical following the massive after-concert party which was being hosted by the band's newest member, Hellfire the Kitten. Gore had a room to himself at the hotel with four of the sexiest escorts in the city, and it was the best 42 seconds of Gore's entire life before he passed out. By morning, Hellfire had the three unconscious musicians hauled up by their demon security guards and tossed into the tour bus which brought the band to the next venue, Barbarella's in Portland, Oregon. Just as in LA, the same thing occurred in Portland. The band played the same set as they had in LA and, when they played their last song, I Make You Be No Be Good, the now violently fueled crowd burst from the club to cause mass vandalism, rioting, burning and looting in the streets of Portland before the song had even ended. However, ever since such behaviour had been labelled by the media as mostly peaceful, absolutely no one showed any hint of concern, nor did anyone figure out that the heavily browed, slope-headed, barely comprehensible hairy people arrested that night had just come from the Diplodocus show. Hey, Gore, said Swifty from the back of the tour bus, reading an article online from a social Portland music site. It was mid-afternoon and the band was on its way to the next show in Seattle. Gore rolled over, inadvertently tossing a naked girl from his sleeping compartment. Well, man, said Gore, vainly trying to rub the hangover from his forehead. Was the president at our show last night? What? No. Which one is it? Obama or that guy from Kenya? Dude, it's too early in the morning for my brains to function. Hey, why? Well, answered Swifty, the review of our show last night in Portland practically says, fuck Donald Trump in every other sentence. Dude, yelled Gore, he's from Kenya. Hellfire suddenly appeared and pushed his paw down on the laptop, slamming it closed. Message in said the kitten. It ain't nothing but messaging. Nothing that you losers need to be concerned with. Hellfire snatched up the laptop and began to walk down the narrow hall of the tour bus, stepping over the naked girl who appeared to be part white and part Latino with long curly brown hair. Ah, oh, hey, good morning, Carmen, said Hellfire as he strode to the front of the bus. Ah, you're looking good after your brakes failed and you took that header off the cliff. Yeah, sorry about that, Toots. But hey, your funeral was awesome. Hellfire opened a side window and tossed the laptop out of it and into the road. Wiping his paws together up and down as if he were clapping dirt off them, Hellfire turned around to address the band. Okay, look you yo-yos, listen up. Just like we agreed, it's my job to control the messaging. It's your job to get up on stage, act like idiots, and absolutely not question the messaging. Don't worry about what's going on around you. All that's beyond your control. The cigar suddenly appeared in the kitten's paws. Just shut up. Be quiet. Do what you've been told and we'll all be happy, yeah? Savvy? Gore, Swifty and Bert stared open-mouthed at the kitten before Bert grunted. Hungry? Yeah, man, said Gore. We're going to stop somewhere or what? Rolling his eyes, Hellfire yelled at the demon bus driver. Hey, driver, try to find us a Waffle House or something. Nothing but the best for these clowns. Over breakfast, Gore talked about how he wanted to change up the set a little bit for the show in Seattle and put I Make You Be No Be Good as the third song. They all looked at Hellfire as if seeking approval. The annoyed kitten pushed his tumbler of cheap breakfast bourbon aside and said, What are you looking at me for? You clowns go ahead and do what you want. I'm just a drummer here, remember? As long as that song is somewhere in the lineup, you meatheads can play Color Me Bad covers for all I freaking care. Diplodocus opened to a jam-packed and energetic house in Seattle's underground nightclub. However, just as they'd finished their third song, and were transitioning to do a cover of I Want to Sex You Up. The band found themselves completely alone on stage, the once rollicking crowd of fans having burst out into the streets to commit acts of wanton destruction and carnage. 
Swifty stood in the middle of the stage, legs spread wide apart, tongue sticking out and guitar raised above his head, when he suddenly stopped and looked around, finally realising that the rest of the band had stopped playing. Where'd everybody go? Gore shrugged. Dunno. Maybe they don't like our sound. Ah, don't worry about them, smiled Hellfire, as the sounds of bottles breaking, car alarms blaring, fire truck sirens and people screaming and gunshots raged outside. They're pretty lame folks around here. Yeah, folks in Seattle aren't really known for their diversity or eclectic taste in music. Fickle, grunted Bert. Yeah, said Hellfire, hopping off the drum set. Come on, boys, our work here is done. I got a plane waiting for us at the airport to take us to Chicago. Whilst on the crowded flight to Chicago to start the Midwest leg of their tour, Bert leaned over to Gore and grunted silently. Test. Ah, you were thinking that too, Herbert, said Gore, looking around and whispering so that Hellfire couldn't hear him, though the kitten was sitting up in first class being fawned over by the female flight attendants while the rest of the band sat in coach. Bert nodded. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. Whenever we play, I make you be no be good. Some weird shit happens that never happened before we recruited the kitten to be our drummer, pondered Gore. It's like, after we signed that deal with the devil, stuff started happening that we didn't expect to happen. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that the talking kitty might have something to do with it. I mean, we'd never met him before the day we signed that contract, and I've never seen him playing with any other bands. Gore put his hand on his chin, pondering even more, before turning to Bert. So you're saying that we put I Make You Be No Be Good as the opening song in our set and see what happens? Sort of like an experiment. And if the crowd bugs out after that song, we know that we're going to have issues and confront the kitten. Bert nodded furiously as he pointed at Gore. Yeah, that's right, Bert, said Gore, smiling triumphantly. I pondered. Diplodocus started their epic Midwest leg of the tour at Subterranean in Chicago's Wicker Park. Just listen to them, boys, said Hellfire, gulping down a bottle of Jim Beam as the rest of the band either poked, snorted, or snapped into whatever vices they needed to get ready for the show. That's the biggest crowd yet, even larger than the one at Whiskey A Go Go. Tonight's gonna be epic. Well, the show opened with a pyrotechnic explosion followed by a shower of sparks and smoke as Diplodocus belted out the first song, I Make You Be No Be Good. Well, Hellfire was right. The crowd in the subterranean was easily three times the size of their earlier shows. Hellfire was especially animated tonight, furiously pounding on the drums with wild, gyrating paws while making adorable, evil, kitten-devil faces at the crowd. Swifty, too, was also playing with his usual wild abandon, the guitar gifted to him by the demon playing intricate chords which were far above Swifty's normal level of playing. Gore and Bert, however, were a bit less rambunctious than they had been before, observing the riotous crowd steadily become even more agitated and violent. Once again, before the song had even concluded, the ravenous crowd of grunting, heaving, slope-headed, flat-faced Neanderthals had bounded out of the club and into the streets, leaving behind an elderly lady sitting on a metal chair, knitting a colourful brass knuckle cosy next to the merch table. Within seconds, Gore, Swifty and Bert were standing around the elderly lady who was wearing pastel-coloured clothes that one would expect grandparents would wear when they were going to Friday night bingo at the local church hall. I looked down at her with bewilderment. Lady, 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 shouted Gore. Are you okay, lady? The old woman said nothing, seemingly oblivious to what had gone on as she concentrated on her knitting. Suddenly, Bert reached over and gently shook her shoulder, saying, Boink! yelped the old, startled lady, finally looking up from her knitting to see three skinny, tattooed men wearing cheetah-patterned loincloths staring down at her. I said, uh, you okay? repeated Gore. What? Oh, hang on, said the elderly woman as she pulled the earbuds from her ears. The Christian band Striper's song, To Hell with the Devil, blaring from her earpieces. 
I brought my grandson here because he said he needed to do some research on prehistoric maiden habits at school. She looked around, confused. Hey, where where did everyone go? Okay, fellas. Hellfire sauntered down the now empty venue, a cigar in one hand and a twirling drumstick in the other. Time to get on the bus again. Next stop, Wisconsin. Oh, uh, okay. Now, hold on, kitten. Yelled Gore, pointing a finger at the bemused kitten. We've got a bone to pick with you. You've got some serious explaining to do. Right, chimed in Swifty. Then, turning to look at Gore, he said, Uh, about what? Yeah, Gore, said Hellfire, purposely stretching out his name into a threatening purr. The kitten's eyes suddenly burst into blazing, fiery pits. About what? Gore looked nervously at Bert, who was furiously shaking his head. Um, nothing, stammered Gore. Uh, Wisconsin, you say? That's right, smiled Hellfire, his eyes now returning back to their wide, adorable selves. Now, in a jovial tone, Hellfire said, Wisconsin, Kenosha to be exact, and, well, I was going to let this be a surprise, but after Kenosha, we're traveling to Toronto, where Diplodocus will be filming their very first live concert video for Nuclear Death Blast, <laughs> whatever the hell record company you losers signed with. Hellfire opened his paws and pushed the band away from the perplexed old grandmother and ushered them backstage to where the bus was waiting in the parking lot to take them the very short distance to Kenosha. Ah, short night, her fellows, said Hellfire. Come on, Waffle House is on me. Curiously, there was absolutely no mention of the very abridged Diplodocus show on any Chicago news outlets, although the news did mention that, over the weekend, violent gun crimes in Chicago had dropped from 103 shootings last weekend to only 98 shootings this. However, over the same weekend, violent crimes involving heavy wooden clubs committed by people dressing and acting like inarticulate Neanderthals had increased in the city of Chicago by nearly 4%. As it turned out, Hellfire actually applauded the idea of playing I Make You Be No Be Good as the opening song for the Kenosha show, commenting that ah, the sooner we get this over with, the sooner I can get back to my girl. I swear the things I gotta do to get a damn contract with the devil. The band was staying in a cheap hotel in Kenosha as they'd arrived there much earlier than expected. The band shared one room while Hellfire naturally had a room to himself. Bert had snuck over to Hellfire's room, quietly opening the door to see what the kitten was doing. Peering around the corner, he found Hellfire lying in bed on the phone, talking sweetly to someone on the other line. No, no, baby girl. Your Charlie isn't lost. Your little Charlie is just fine. I just have some loose ends to tie up, and I'll be home. I'll bring you something nice, Maybe a new stuffed unicorn since your last one got a bit messed up. I know, honey. I miss you too. Take a bath tonight and use the strawberry shampoo before you go to bed, okay? Hellfire put the phone down then and turned over to go to sleep, muttering, Oh, I love that little stinker. Bert quickly ran back to his room and said, Sleeping. Goran Bert stood over Swifty as he sat in a seat in the corner. So, well, let me get this straight, said Swifty. Our song, I Make You Be No Be Good, is actually making people be no be good, said Swifty. Yep, said Gore, as Bert nodded his head. And so when they hear that song, the people leave the club and the show ends? Yep, said Gore, as Bert again nodded his head. And if the show ends early and the people leave... Yeah, said Gore, breathlessly. Yes, repeated Bert. Swifty's eyes lit up as understanding finally came to him. When that happens, I don't get my freaking blow. No show, no blow. That son of a bitch. Gore and Bert stared at each other before finally shrugging and nodding. Yeah, yeah, dude, said Gore. You see, we can play any song except that one. If we do, all hell breaks loose. Well, isn't that what we want? 
said Swifty. I mean, isn't that what cave metal's all about? An unthinking, unfeeling, uncaring rush of aggression-fueled carnage, bordering on complete anarchy. A brain-dead mob of fully vaccinated anarchists who just want to have fun breaking stuff. Well, um, uh, yeah, actually, Gore replied, scratching the back of his head. And didn't Hellfire make good on his promise to supply you with as many chicks as you can handle? Uh, yeah, said Gore. But they all seemed rather cold and stiff, and their faces were expressionless, and their breath kind of stank. Okay, said Swifty. So as long as you keep getting your girls, and I keep getting my blow, and Bird over there keeps getting filthy rich off his investments in meat stick products, what's the big deal? Accountability, grunted Bert. Gore and Swifty stopped and stared at Bert for several seconds before they both dropped their heads in shame. Ah, uh, you're right, Bert, said Swifty. Actions and personal choices have consequences. We can't just incite a mob into violence and say, oh, the devil made me do it. Sorry that I wavered there, bro. Well, okay then, said Gore. Let's go wake up Hellfire and tell him we aren't going to play that song anymore. The kitten sat propped up on pillows in his bed, his paws behind his head and looking up at the three idiots who'd stormed into his room with a bemused look on his face. So, uh, let me get this straight, said Hellfire in a snarky tone. A cigar suddenly appeared in his paws and lit itself as Hellfire took a long drag before puffing out three thick smoke rings which drifted to the three band members, momentarily choking them in a sulfuric-smelling cloud. Yeah, you three yo-yos barged into my room and woke me up just to tell me that you're refusing to play I Make You Be No Be Good. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, coughed Gore, waving his hands to dissipate the smoke. We'll play every song in the set, but we refuse to play I Make You Be No Be Good anymore, or at least until you leave the band. Hellfire snapped his paw, and a laptop appeared hovering over the bed. The screen opened, displaying an image of the contract they'd signed with the demon Billy Z. Bob. Gentlemen, Need I remind you that you all put your hand, John Cox, on this contract, which stipulates that you put your faces on stage, and you will play I Make You Be No Be Good, and that we control the messaging. Yeah, said Swifty, but we can't have our fans go turning into stupefied cave dwellers at our concerts. Who's going to buy our music if that happens? Do I really need to answer that? said Hellfire. Still, you can't make us play that song. We refuse. Diplodocus will not play that song until after you leave. Halfire's eyes narrowed into devilish slits, his lips curling to expose hideously long and sharp fangs. Ah, really now? He put his cigarette out on the bed next to him and got up, walking menacingly across the bed towards the band. Gore, Swifty, and Bert stepped back in intimidation as Hellfire neared the edge of the bed. You know what, Gore? sneered Hellfire. Gore stood frozen in fear before the little kitten. You got some real balls of steel, you know that? Well, you have to. You've been screwing zombie chicks ever since your tour started. <laughs> what? gasped Gore. Okay, fellas laughed Hellfire. I'll make you a deal. You guys play the song just one more time, and I'll consider the contract fulfilled. What do you say? The three looked at each other, suddenly unsure of how to respond. Come on, it's freaking Kenosha, Wisconsin. What could possibly go wrong here? I promise you fellas that you only have to play the song one more time, and then you'll never have to play it again for the rest of your lives. Deal? Promise? grunted Bert. Of course I promise, answered Hellfire. Come on, man. Did I ever lie to you before? It was a Tuesday night in August, and Diplodocus opened with, I make you be, no be good. The band wanting to finish the ordeal of what they were doing as quickly as possible. And, like every time before, the crowd stormed out into the streets of Kenosha to revel in acts of hatred, chaos, and violence. 
Even before the crowd had left, Gore, Swifty, and Bert were already headed backstage, followed by Hellfire, who was in extremely good spirits. The band, however, was not feeling as festive as the kitten. Well, fellas, after tonight, Diplodocus is off to Toronto. Hellfire jumped onto a leather couch, reaching over to snatch up a sandwich from the catering table. So, um, yeah, that's it, right? yelled Gore. That's it. We don't have to play that song anymore. We're good, right? Hellfire stopped himself from biting down on the sandwich and instead looked up at the band. He held the band in his gaze for a few seconds before smirking and saying, Yeah, sure, whatever. I never lied to you, yo-yos. You don't have to play the song anymore. He leaned back, smiling in satisfaction as he took a bite of the sandwich. Really? grunted Bert. Of course, answered Hellfire as he snapped his paws. Mo, Larry, Zuckerberg, get rid of these clowns. We got what we need. On command, the band's three demon bodyguards stepped from the shadows and began walking menacingly towards Gore, Swifty, and Bert. As they neared the startled band, the forms of the demons began to change slowly shifting from big, burly, muscle-bound goons to skinny, pale, lanky, tattooed cave metal musicians who were wearing cheetah pad and loincloths. The only difference between their appearance and the real band members was that the demon doppelgangers had no face. Wait, stuttered Swifty. You said we'd be going to Europe to film a video. Did you lie? That's Canada, you idiot, replied Hellfire. Which is part of Europe? Hellfire rolled his eyes at Swifty. I said Diplodocus will be filming a video in Toronto. I never said you'd be. Wait, said Gore as his demon doppelganger reached for him. You said that you needed us. Nope, answered Hellfire, grabbing up a gyro wrap from the catering table. I said, we needed your faces. Yikes, grunted Bert. Yeah, said Hellfire. You shouldn't have played that song tonight. Diplodocus's first tour and their subsequent video for I Make You Be No Be Good catapulted the band to internet stardom almost overnight. The video being viewed by nearly a quarter of a million people within the first week of release. Nuclear death whatever the hell record company Diplodocus had signed with, extended the band's tour to a few East Coast venues before sending them across to Great Britain and mainland Europe to play a few shows and festivals. Eager to cash in on the hypnotic messaging of this new genre of metal, the record company rushed to release the band's next album, named Fully Vaccinated Diplodocus Death Guard, featuring the band's next hit, I do your thinking for you. And the surprisingly sweet love ballad. You, not science, are your science. By now, Diplodocus was at the very top of all the metal charts. The hair metal charts, the arena metal charts, the death metal charts, the symphonic metal charts, and, of course, the cave metal charts. All of them. But it wasn't only that. Their song had across musical genres, and now Diplodocus stood atop the rock charts, the rap charts, the rock rap charts, the gangster rap charts, hip-hop, R&B, jazz, techno, techno-pops, K-pop, J-pop, bluegrass country, new age, and every other musical chart which anyone could possibly conceive of. Diplodocus stood at the absolute pinnacle of not only global musical influence, but also global social and political influence. They looked down upon a world that admired, adored, and worshipped them as the greatest thinkers and geniuses of the modern world, if not all of human history. And in the world today, Diplodocus followers still sing the lyrics to the hit, I do your thinking for you. There none need think for yourself. There know who good or smart think. Dear Plodocus had big brain over all the flat earth. And 
another phenomenal story there from the ever-wonderful Taxi Dancer. What on earth was that all about? Well, Diplodocus, Dearth Metal, Gave Metal, whatever. <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing the, uh, the grunting along to those uh, lyrics, and I hope you enjoyed my efforts. <laughs> well, here we are. I've just missed the hour mark by 15 seconds, coming up to 30 seconds. Oh, well, can't hit the hour dead on every single time, so, well, what are you going to do? Hope you just enjoyed the story. Um, weird and wonderful one there this evening. I have a huge mega collaboration coming up very soon between me and um, a bunch of other storytellers. So that's going to come out maybe on Friday sometime around the new year. Big party. Lots and lots of other people involved in that one. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So hoping you're going to stick around because it's not just me. I know you can come here to listen to me, but I do like to give opportunities to up and coming storytellers to... Um, Join me here. Um, I've been pretty successful and I like to share that with people who share my passion for doing this. What am I talking about? Enough from me. Well, my dear friends, that's it for this evening. Back again very, very soon. See you again next time. Till then, very, very sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.